Good evening. I'm Laura Allison, Vice Chair of the Harrisburg Strong Task Force. We, we would like to welcome you to our second public forum. We will begin with a brief presentation and then open it up for public comment. Before we begin, I would like to thank the YWCA for hosting us again tonight. And to introduce the members of the task force, Pat Stringer, Shannon Williams, co-chair of Les Ford, Carl Singleton, Jackie Parker, Dave Black, and co-chair Doug Hill. I'll turn it over to Doug. Thank you, Laura. And I'm going to get this up so I'm short of her at this time. Um, I want to thank you as well for being out here tonight. And uh, this is the second of our public meetings to review the work that the task force has done to date. And uh, we just are going to go through a quick PowerPoint just to give you a little bit of background again, uh, and then talk about where we've come since the last uh, meeting. And then uh, we will talk a little bit about what we're going to include in the plan, and then discuss a little bit uh, about what's, what happens in our next steps. So where did, where did we come from? Well, the uh, Harrisburg Strong Plan uh, had some additional funding that uh, is available, about $16 million. And the plan said that uh, the uh, receiver was to create a task force, this task force, uh, to establish the mechanism by which that funding would be distributed. And so the very specific tasks that we had uh, that are delineated in the Harrisburg Strong Plan are to create uh, two 501c3 corporations uh, to provide for their structure and governance and to provide for their administration and distribution of funds. Now, let me elaborate a little bit on the funding that's available. Uh, under the plan, $16 million was set aside for three specific purposes. Uh, one for economic development projects, one for infrastructure improvement projects, and then a, a portion uh, that goes to the city's OPEP, that's uh, uh, other post-employment benefits. Uh, this group is to put together the 501c3s that would administer the economic development and infrastructure improvement. The OPEP actually goes to a different group to administer. And then for each of those program areas, uh, economic development gets $6.153 million, and another $6.153 million is set aside for infrastructure improvement. That's money that's currently in the bank. Uh, there is the potential that other funding would uh, be added to those accounts. Uh, that could be based on other recoveries as a part of the strong plan. And then the organizations also have the capacity to seek additional funding uh, from other sources. Now, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to give you a further update on the work that we've done up until now. And we're going to review for you as well the elements of our final plan and recommendations. Uh, we'll emphasize again the purpose of the meeting tonight is not to take uh, input on specific projects or project ideas, but rather the types of projects and the things that, that uh, we've suggested should be funded and, and to get your idea on the kinds of things uh, that should be eligible. So uh, the major part of the, tonight's meeting is about getting uh, your input on the element of the plan, elements of the plan. To date, uh, this group was convened on March 10th. We were given four months to complete our work. Uh, we anticipate meeting that deadline uh, with the submission of a final plan by June 30th. Uh, we've conducted a number of regular working meetings, uh, about every three weeks at minimum. And we've also divided into a couple different subcommittees to deal with specific topic areas that have uh, done other background work in between uh, those meetings. We had our first public meeting on May 29th, and we took comments there. Uh, the comments uh, have also been uh, considered as a part of our subsequent meetings and our uh, revisions and additions to the plan. And then following, uh, actually uh, on June 19th, uh, we posted on the website some of the background information that we've been working on. Uh, some of it is in a little bit more detail, others are really more examples of what we're going to be including in the final plan. But the bottom line was we tried to uh, get some information out in advance. Uh, in addition, for uh, 
for those who were at the last meeting and supplied an email address, we did send out the link uh, to uh, where that information could be found. And then uh, following this meeting, we'll be uh, getting together at least one more time and we'll be working on the final plan. And again, our intent is uh, to submit uh, the final draft uh, by uh, June 30th deadline. The website uh, where the information currently can be found is on the uh, Department of Community Affairs website, which is newpa.com, N-E-W-P-A.com. And when you go there, you click on the local government page, and from there you go down to the center of the page and you see Act 47. And when you get to the Act 47 page, you go down to Harrisburg, and that's where uh, all of our documents are, are contained at the moment. So, there are three primary elements of the plan, uh, the governance structure, uh, funding process and grant structure, and public access. I'm going to talk briefly about each of those. Uh, first is uh, the governance structure, and the Harrisburg Strong Plan, what was called Exhibit 8, uh, had a list of necessary components. Uh, there were, it was a bulleted list of about uh, 25 or 26 things that uh, the receiver wanted this group to address as a part of its plan. Uh, one of the documents that we have on the website uh, is uh, that list and our brief response on how we're addressing each of those as a part of the plan. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the strong plan calls for us to create two 501c3s. Uh, we actually determined that it would be more efficient uh, to do it as a single 501c3, not just because one body is more efficient than two, but also because its two purposes are economic development and infrastructure improvement. And quite often there's a cross tie between the two. Now we also have a requirement that the funding set aside for each of those is accounted for and granted separately, but they will fall under the same body. Uh, the governance structure is also to provide for public access and accountability. And uh, if you take a look through the necessary components and some of the other things we've talked about tonight, you'll see how that's accomplished. Uh, at the moment, our draft includes a nine-member board. Uh, that's something that uh, we are still discussing a little bit, but uh, we believe that seems to be uh, a fair number. It's diverse enough that we can capture uh, a good cross-section of town, but at the same time, it's small enough that it's agile and, and it can get some work done. Uh, in the draft, we uh, have the board appointed in much the same manner that this group was appointed. And that is, uh, it's appointed by the coordinator, that's uh, through the Office of the Department of Community, Community and Economic Development. Uh, but it's from a list uh, submitted by the mayor, the council, uh, the county commissioners, and then uh, from the coordinator as well. Uh, the other things that are part of the governance structure are articles of incorporation, and that includes all the documents that we have to file, both to incorporate under Pennsylvania law and then to seek the 501c3 uh, designation under federal law. Uh, and then it includes a set of bylaws that govern how uh, the organization operates. And we also included in that uh, separate statement on conflict of interest, uh, a draft sample draft of the bylaws, not the actual bylaws for this group, but uh, something that will give you a sense of how it will be structured is on the website. And then a sample of the conflict of interest policy uh, is also on the web page. Funding process and the grant structure is something we've been taking a considerable amount of time with. Uh, I hope you will forgive the small font on this page as we try to put a lot on the screen and essentially to help you with that, uh, what is on the screen right now was one of the handouts that was at the back of the room as you came in right next to the agenda. Uh, I hope you've had an opportunity to take a look at that a little bit as uh, we were getting set up uh, and getting meeting started, but this is really the meat of what we intend for the 501c3 to do to drive the uh, economic development and infrastructure improvement money out into the community. Uh, we start with a set of guiding principles, and uh, the probably the overriding principle is that the intent is to help the city of Harrisburg grow, recognize its diversity, recognize the diversity of neighborhoods, and benefit the entire city, uh, to prove the city is a place to live, a place to work, a place that people want to visit. Uh, it includes a number of specific elements toward that end. Uh, very strict accountability of funds, 
leveraging other funds as, to the extent we can. Uh, while six million dollars in each pot is real money, uh, we think we can do more to leverage that and, and really grow what uh, the 501c3 is able to do. Uh, the money is to be driven out on a grant basis through a uh, delineated scoring process. And the scoring uh, will take into account a number of different factors. Uh, and some of those are delineated in, in the documents that we have on the web page. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, it is as much as possible to be an objective process by which we determine, or by which the 501c3 determines what projects are going to be funded and, and under what terms. We want to recognize uh, a number of communities as a part of the process. We want to provide uh, additional uh, scoring opportunities if, if there's benefit uh, to minority and to women and to other uh, business enterprises. Uh, and we want to uh, be sure that everything that is done through these grants produces measurable outcomes. This isn't to help sustain an organization, or other pay for operating expenses of organization. This is to do bricks and mortar. This is to do real projects of real and direct benefit uh, to all aspects of the community. We also want to try to do this in a way that is going to create jobs, and most particularly jobs for residents of the city. And so the scoring criteria also uh, gives additional uh, recognition if it is a business that uh, regularly works in the city, is incorporated in the city, or uh, employs a, a large number of people within the city. Now, when we divide the money up under economic development projects, uh, there are uh, two different kinds of projects in particular that uh, we are recommending for grants. Uh, about half of the money we are recommending go toward large project grants. And those range up to about a half a million dollars. Uh, then there are community building grants, and those have, uh, are typically going to be smaller, but they're going to be uh, targeted toward uh, very specific outcomes. And that would be about 20, 25 to 30 percent of the available money. The rest of the money under uh, economic development projects will be contingency funding. We all have seen instances where something comes up and needs to be dealt with right away. St. Cole. Uh, all those kinds of things. And so a set, a, a, about 20% is going to be set aside in the contingency fund. Uh, most of that, I would anticipate, is going to go out to the city itself as, as particular projects and issues arise. The second pot of fund is for infrastructure projects, and the infrastructure projects will almost exclusively uh, be city or authority. And uh, those will be all of the things that you can envision as a part of infrastructure, water, sewer, uh, it could include uh, things related to recycling trash collection, it could include uh, things related to uh, transit, although if it's transit related it has to be for the benefit of the residents of the city. And that also has a, a contingency fund uh, built in as a part of it. Third area that uh, we're addressing in the plan is public access. And one of the things that we have to emphasize is that a 501c3 is not a governmental entity under Pennsylvania's Open Meetings Law. So it doesn't fall under that statute. It's not required uh, to meet any of the provisions of that statute. However, we do want to set this up in a way uh, that is that it is an open uh, and transparent agency. Uh, so we're uh, going to include recommendation for a website. The website will have uh, all of the relevant documents uh, relating to the 501c3 as well as the minutes and all the other actions that the entity takes. Um, what we anticipate on applications themselves, when applications come in, the applications will not go up to the website, but at some point, if the applications that uh, are deemed acceptable to move on to the consideration process will be put up on the website for public inspection. Uh, the uh, selection process uh, will be done uh, ultimately by the board of the 501c3, but the, uh, the uh, articles and the bylaws will provide that the board can hire staff. We're recommending uh, a lean staff, so most likely just an executive director and some support staff, and then uh, other things that uh, need done like uh, legal counsel or accounting probably uh, uh, by contract with uh, 
goes outside. But the bottom line is, in terms of the process, the executive director will take a first run through the applications, run them against the score, and run them against uh, the other criteria that are part of the selection process, and then move the ones that meet the criteria on to the board for discussion and action. Uh, the board, uh, as we envision, would take them up at an open meeting, and then uh, we would have a limited comment period before final action on any of the applications. And the reason we say a limited comment period, well, we want to get feedback from the community. We also don't want this to be a cumbersome process. The intent is to make the money available, get it out on the street, and get, get these projects moving. So, next steps from here. Uh, we are continuing our work as a task force to review and synthesize the public comments. Those that we've received so far, anything that we get from you tonight, and anything that you want to submit uh, after this evening. Uh, we do provide the opportunity for that uh, on the form. Uh, we've indicated where you can uh, send uh, traditional mail, email, uh, and otherwise into uh, to us. Uh, we will be doing the final draft plan in the coming week, and uh, then the, we will be meeting as a group to review that and make our final recommendations that will be submitted uh, to the uh, coordinator, the 47 coordinator, uh, our target being June 30th. Uh, following that, it will be up to the coordinator uh, to work through the plan, uh, and at some point after that, it will actually have to be submitted to the court as well for the court's approval. So, again, if you have, if you would like additional information or if you have questions or comments uh, that you want to submit after tonight, uh, this information is also on your agenda. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Laura. Concerns I have, uh, although DCED selects the initial board of directors, it appears um, under necessary components on the first page under procedures regarding appointment and removal that there'll be a board nominating committee to recommend candidates for replacement as either people are resigned or are removed or their terms expire. It sounds like the board's going to be replacing themselves. Um, I would give some second thought to that. Um, I would also uh, suggest that no member of the task force should be eligible to serve on the board of directors of the Impact Harrisburg uh, organization. Uh, at the bottom of page one under necessary components, there's a reference to a five-year action plan, which is sort of what this whole Harrisburg Strong Plan is about. I'm assuming this group of people are not preparing a five-year action plan, am I right? So that'll be job number one of the 
new board and executive director. And I think the city as well. Uh, on page two, under development of decision criteria for joint venture, it says the board will not be developing projects or making direct investment in projects, just providing grant funding. I wouldn't limit that. Um, maybe initially you may want to do that, but I wouldn't limit the possibility that this organization becomes vibrant with visionary leadership that has the ability to seek multi-million dollar grants from around the country to fund this community. There may be other opportunities. Um, I also would ask you to give second thought to the matching fund requirement. Um, there's a number of uh, programs I can think of for example, if we need, if the city decides to have an urban forester, where's the money going to come from for the budget to deal with 200 dead trees that are currently a threat to the people who live where those dead trees are located? Where are we going to find the funds to hire the necessary people to support our urban forester? There may be some grant funding from tree vitalized, but I wouldn't rely upon that because you're competing with other communities, so you might have an urban forester with a budget. There should be the ability, I don't know if it's economic development or infrastructure, but there should be the ability for this silo to fund a particular program, uh, whether it's public works or trees. Um, job training. Um, we desperately need job training. There are good organizations, there are things happening at HACC and other places, but we need a particular focus on the youth and, and the young people in the city who have been failed by our school system. And there's a need for job training, and there's not going to be matching funds. Uh, there may be for some, but you should have the ability to fund job training, and most importantly, summer job programs for hundreds of teenagers in the city that where the city doesn't have the money. I mean, the city just posted very limited summer opportunities. There should be the ability of this to I think it enhances the livability of the city if we can um, give some opportunities to the children in the city. With respect, thank you for not having time on this part. <laughs> um, and that's we were only here two hours ago, well, that's it. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't have a half hour <laughs> Um Unfortunately, the, the bulk of the people who were here last time, for whatever reason, are not here today. Um, and uh, I note the mayor's presence, but I note no other elected officials. And that's disappointing because I think this is the most important issue happening in this city today. Um, briefly, under the impact guidelines, um, I'm just not sure what the culture of our neighborhoods are. I mean, it's pretty obvious in a couple of places. There's a culture of the, the Midtown and Allison Hill and Shotgun, but, but when somebody has to come in for an economic development project and show support for the neighborhood, does it mean it has to be a formal association and a vote by the association board or a number of letters from a certain number of people? Um, I'm just concerned about the ambiguity of that. Prevailing wage on page four of the impact guidelines. I support the prevailing wage, but um, I'm not sure legally does it have to be applicable. Um, we, it, the heads are all nodding. Never mind. Delete that comment. Under large economic development projects, can money be given from these silos to fund a proposed city land bank? Can the money just say, hey, new land bank authority, here's $1,000, here's $100,000. Under eligible uses, um, I think there's a type. It says acquisition, redevelopment of blighted sites, demolition, construction, site development. Then it says on site and site to main infrastructure improvements. What's, what's missing there? Or, I don't understand that. Um, based on the amount of money in the maximum grant, it looks like we're only gonna have potentially six large economic development projects. I'm concerned on page six. Process for accessing funds under item five, the potential for clawback. Conceptually, yeah, if somebody comes in and rips us off, you know, the David Dodds of the world, yes, there should be a clawback. But I'm a little concerned of, of how that might inhibit someone from saying, I'm going to create X number of jobs with this 
project and whatever happens in the economy or in the city, it doesn't happen, they, necess they shouldn't necessarily, I mean, there should be some discretion. And hopefully there will be discretion. Um, community building grant guidelines. Um, it looks like this is sort of the, the HUD facade improvement program. I'm wondering whether this would apply to homeowners seeking assistance for energy efficiency audits, weatherization, uh, inspection of their water or sewer laterals to ensure that they're properly operating. Under eligible uses, it talks about these community building grants are designed to support five-year neighborhood strategies. I know there's a couple out there, but where are these five-year strategies and for which neighborhoods? And if a neighborhood doesn't have a five-year strategy, is the comprehensive plan that's being developed going to have five-year strategies for neighborhoods? And if there isn't a five-year strategy, does that mean you're not eligible for community building grants? Infrastructure grants. You're proposing the possibility of funding a private homeowner's um, sewer or water problem. Um, there's some legislation running through the legislature that will authorize municipal authorities to provide funding for this. I would suggest there is a program in the city of Harrisburg where homeowners can purchase insurance specifically for their water line or sewer line. And I would suggest that if someone is going to be eligible for an infrastructure grant through this process, that they have to demonstrate they have that private insurance for their water or sewer lateral, and that the cost of replacement exceeded the amount of insurance available to them. So that this is sort of stopgap as opposed to the first line of funding. Page 11 under application guidelines number three, it's capital region water, City water. So I hope he knows that. That's it. Um, thank you for your service. Um, it's much appreciated, and uh, good luck. Thank you.
things as, as discreet and, and finite as a summer uh, program. Uh, those are things we have discussed. I don't think we, we have reached any resolution, and it is really not our place to reach a resolution on that. But it is, I think, our duty to make sure that we are as inclusive of ideas as possible at this point. So a lot of the things that you say are not fully really fleshed out. They are not fully really fleshed out because uh, we just wanted to make sure they were in the checklist of things to be considered by the board and hopefully in their new jobs. One final comment that has to do with uh, public access. While there's a discussion about uh, the requirement for sunshine law, I think at the last meeting, Neil, you're there, you can defend yourself on this quote here. Uh, you made the comment that when this board comes online, that is the time for the public to seek to influence uh, the direction that they go. So we're not excluding, uh, we're not limiting public input to, the, to this board, but we assume there will be some public influence on the following board by virtue of that public attention. So these are guidelines, but the newly established board and executive director will have the discretion to adopt their own bylaws, to establish their own policies and procedures, and they may say a match is preferable but not necessary as one example. But these are guidelines recommendations for this new organization. They're not binding. I think that in discrete areas that would be true. I don't want to say that would be universally true because what's the point of having us? They're simply going to have the ability to countermand everything we do. But I think we're trying to give them some guidance just as the receiver trying to give us some guidance. And uh, the selection process of, of who will be on that board will certainly drive uh, the thinking of that board around these discrete areas. Thank you.
Thank you for attending.